you don't have to be a software architect to think like a software architect. And this gives you several advantages. First, a more effective and well-built system, even as a developer. And also, a good head start on a really fun and rewarding career path. So that's what I want to show you in this keynote. You don't have to be an architect to think like an architect, but what does that even mean? So I want to start by showing you these clouds. <clears throat> what are these? Well, they're clouds. But it's very fascinating because to different people, these clouds represent different things. Uh, to a meteorologist, they look up at the sky at those clouds, and they see all the cloud types, and they know what the weather patterns and what to expect. Um, maybe as an artist, you look up at those same exact clouds, and you're picturing a beautiful, dramatic scene. Of course, all of us are in IT. So when we look up at the sky and see those clouds, yeah, we kind of think of cloud-based deployments, the Internet of Things. Yeah. What does this mean? When I showed you those clouds, everybody sees them with a different eye, a different perspective. And that's what I want to show you about architectural thinking. What does it mean to think like an architect, to, to see a problem with an architect's eye, an architect's point of view? Well, I'm going to answer that question, and that's what my keynote is all about. But I first want to actually just show you why thinking like an architect is important, regardless of your role. So let's say we're uh, in a situation where we're doing some messaging or event-driven architecture. And what you see here on the far right-hand side is an order placement service. And it's going to send a message to payment and inventory. And so once I place an order, I have to pay for it, and we have to decrement inventory. And of course, we have a database. And so you have a choice to make as a developer. Hmm. Well, when I send that order, should I include all of that order payload, all 45 different attributes, or should I only send just the key? Because with a full data payload, of course, I insert the data, I send all of that message over, and payment and inventory have all the data now. But I wonder, I've got another choice. What about key-based? You see, I still, if I'm processing that order, I still insert that order into the database. But now, I only send the key out in that message or event. Well, payment and inventory both receive that, but now they have to query the database in order to get the information they need. So what do we do? Well, let's see. Obviously, says the developer, uh, the full event payload is the right choice because we get much better scalability and performance. I don't have to go to the database. I mean, this is one of the ways of creating scalable systems and high performance systems. So this is the clear choice. Yeah, says the architect, but, um, but what about what sort of contract are you going to use? Is it going to be a strict contract with a schema, or are all 45 of those attributes going to be a loose contract with just something like JSON? Are you going to pass an object in that message? Um, and how are you going to manage it? How are you going to version it when you make changes? Because you don't want to break everything. Oh. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And what are you going to do about stamp coupling and bandwidth issues that are going to occur with this? And the developer says, what are you talking about? Stamp coupling is a form of coupling where you pass all of the information to a particular service, but it only uses a few pieces of it, maybe even one or two attributes. That's called stamp coupling. And two problems occur, change, and bandwidth issues. Let me show you what I mean. If I change this contract and change a field that payment and inventory are not using, well, of course, I have to change 
but that might facilitate a change in payment and inventory as well, even though I don't care about that field. That's what stamp coupling is about. But there's also bandwidth issues because you see that entire order is 500 KB. So 500 KB is being sent to both payment and inventory. Payment only needs 350 KB. Inventory only needs 50 KB. So I'm unnecessary, unnecessarily utilizing bandwidth I don't need. In cloud-based environments, this could get quite expensive. <sighs> hmm. Oh, and there's another problem, by the way. Um, and of course, at this point, the developer starts getting really frustrated. But it keeps going. What about multiple systems of record? Because if you're passing the entire payload of that message over there, that means every one of you have a copy of that. And you're not even looking at the database where the true system of record is. So if I make changes to that order, it may be everywhere. You might not have the latest copy. So that might produce data integrity issues as well. Oh. You know, so the developer says, hmm, you know, these are really good points. You know, you've kind of convinced me. Maybe a key-based event payload would be better. I mean, after all, I wouldn't have to worry about stamp coupling. It's a single name value pair. So there's really no, well, there's still a contract, but I'm never going to change that. I don't have bandwidth issues. I don't have stamp coupling. And you're right. I have a single, single system of record. I get better data integrity. You know, you make really good points. Maybe I should use the key-based. And what happens? The developer now comes along, or the architect comes along and says, yeah, but what are you going to do about scalability and performance now? This is why thinking like an architect is important. Because of our first law of software architecture. And that is that everything in software architecture is a trade-off. And being able to think like an architect and see things with an architect's eye allows you to better analyze these kind of trade-offs to actually make the right decision, to find and seek out those pros and cons. Okay. So let's come back to thinking like an architect. What's involved in thinking like an architect? Being able to apply architectural thinking to your daily job regardless of your title or role. It really involves three core things. The first is, regardless of your role, to be able to understand the importance of those business drivers and the translation to whatever those architectural characteristics are. Do you need high scalability? Do you need high availability, high performance, high agility, high responsiveness? What are those attributes or characteristics of the architecture that are important? Because we are implementing that architecture. We should probably know those. Number two, thinking like an architect is also expanding your breadth of knowledge to be able to see more solutions to the problem. And also thinking like an architect is being able to identify and analyze various trade-offs. These are the three main components of actually seeing a problem with an architect's eye as opposed to a developer's eye. Oh, you still have to see things with a developer's eye, of course, especially when you're faced with a particular algorithm or problem or design problem within your code. But it's also seeing the problem architecturally as well. Now, let's take a look at all three of these and see how they all work. And let's take a look at one of the most foundational pieces of what it means to see things like those clouds with an architect's eye. Because this is what the business is concerned about, regardless of the type of system that you're building. The business is concerned about things like user satisfaction, time to market, competitive advantage, mergers and acquisitions, uh, regulatory compliance. All of these things are big concerns of theirs. Thinking architecturally, is translating these concerns into exactly what the architecture needs to support. 
This is our language. We translate those into things like, oh, fault tolerance, uh, reliability, recoverability, responsiveness, performance, uh, availability. And that's what we need to build into the architecture to support those business needs. That's seeing it with the architect's eye. But there's a problem here because it's a problem of being lost in translation. You see, the language of an architect is talking all about fault tolerance. The language of the business is talking all about user satisfaction. And the problem is these two rarely meet because no one knows what anybody's talking about. And this involves another aspect of thinking architecturally. That brain of an architect becomes like a translation engine. So if this is that important, which it is, because these architectural characteristics become the foundational aspect of any system or product. So if we don't know these, how can we possibly build a system? How can we possibly make decisions? OK, so you've convinced me. Yeah, we need to know these. But how do I know which ones? I mean, I've never th really thought about this, and I'd really like to. As a matter of fact, on Monday, when I kind of go back to work, I might want to start thinking about these. So where do they come from? They come from one of three places. A lot of times, they come just from the domain. I mean the business domain. For example, we're building a new stock trading system to buy and sell stock. Well, I don't need to go through a lot of analysis to know that system has to be fast, high performance, high data integrity. So sometimes we could just extract these from the nature of our business. A lot of times, they're in requirements or user stories. But the user story does not state, we require high elasticity. No, the user story looks like this. We have to support 20 to 200,000 concurrent users and everything in between, and it could be immediate need. So those requirements or user stories are not spelling out that exact ility or architecture characteristic. It's up to us to interpret and know what that is. But it's interesting. In almost every system or product I've worked on, the most valuable place to find out what's important is actually just using your ear and listening to the business. Let's actually do this. This will be fun. So here's an example. <clears throat> Thinking architecturally is that trans translation engine that we have in our mind. So let's say that the business says, oh, yeah, user satisfaction is absolutely the most important thing. We build our company on user satisfaction. So what happens? We translate that to a characteristic. Now, this one's easy, user satisfaction ability. Now, isn't it funny? You could take any word and just add the word ility after it, and all of a sudden, you've got a new characteristic. Yeah. How about markability? Hmm, wonder what that means. Well, that one's easy, too, because I love drawing on slides. I love drawing on whiteboards, and so markability is the ability to make a lot of drawings. <laughs> There was one particular client's engagement I was on where we had fun making up architecture characteristics. We would take the characteristics of somebody on the team and use their name and make an illity. Uh, for example, uh, take the person on the team, I mean, who is the glue on the team. I mean, they just bring everything together. So if we needed high amenability, that means we need high cohesion. We need the system to work together. Uh, maybe you've got somebody, um, Sebastian, who's maybe a, a perfectionist. Everything has to be absolutely perfect. Well, that's Sebastian ability. The ability to have everything absolutely the highest level of data integrity and correctness in that system. It's kind of a fun exercise. You should try it. <laughs> you can make up any word, but it's not really user satisfaction ability. No, this requirement or need comes into our translation engine and out comes all those things the architecture needs to support. Performance, agility, so that we get bug fixes fast, fixed fast. Things like scalability, availability, security, testability, so we don't introduce bugs 
recoverability so I don't lose my work. These are all things that make users happy. And if our architectures don't support these, users will not be happy. This is that whole thing about seeing a particular problem with an architect's perspective. Uh, how about time to market? That's the most important thing. So we feed that into our little translation engine, and out comes all the things that the architecture needs to support. Maintainability, testability, deployability. These are things that we, as not only architects, but developers, need to focus on. That's what we need to support. Um, oh, let's do one more. Mergers and acquisitions. Oh, boy. Yes, we're, we're constantly acquiring new companies. OK, that one's easy. Resumeability. Yes, my job will be replaced. OK. Now, like I said, you can make up any word. <laughs> now, we feed this in. And what do you suppose? It's interesting. Think about this one for a second. Mergers and acquisitions undergoing very heavily in your company. Constantly buying up other companies, merging with other companies. You're an architect. You're a developer. What's on your mind about this? Let's just ponder this one for a little bit. Hmm. Would that matter? Yeah, it would. As a matter of fact, a lot of things. Are we leveraging standards? It's going to make it easier for us to communicate with other systems that we have to. Interoperability. How open or closed are our systems? How scalable are they? Because if we merge with another company, we possibly have just doubled our customer base. Think about that. Can our systems support that extra customer load, that extra user load, the capacities in our database, connection pools, virtual machines. That's a big one on that. All right, so this is one of those kind of translation engines. One of the reasons this is so important is because these, these characteristics, when we see these, help us qualify and make decisions. Now, this is the star rating chart from our book, Fundamentals of Software Architecture. And we can kind of utilize this if, and only if, we know our characteristics. Which architecture style should you use? Microservices, of course. <laughs> no. Which of these eight should you use? I, 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 I don't know. What can I base that on? Oh, what's important to you? Oh, scalability is exactly what we need. We have to be highly scalable. Well, this kind of chart, using qualitative analysis, allows us to kind of look for the areas that have five stars. That means it's really well supported. If the architecture doesn't support scalability, it doesn't matter how much you do from a physical operational standpoint. You won't be able to scale. So consequently, we look at this chart and say, huh, which architectures tend to scale better than others? And we find, of course, microservices, event-driven, and space-based architecture are really good choices. The layered architecture, with one star, is not. How do we know this? Architectural thinking. Being able to see a problem, and this is what an architect sees. I don't see class files. I don't see methods, I don't see algorithms, design patterns. No, oh, what I see floating in front of my face are all of these characteristics. And those are my driving forces to make decisions. Now, a resource that you could actually use. Oh, and by the way, yeah, let's do another one. Let's say that cost and simplicity. We're a startup. Don't have a lot of money. And we don't want to add a lot of complexity at the very, very start of our life as a company. Those are our most important things. We do qualitative analysis. We compare the quality of one thing to another. And we find, hmm, I'm guessing maybe we shouldn't do microservices first. Maybe let's start with a monolith, any one of these three, and then migrate as soon as we find out if this idea is going to work and we start growing. Yeah, these are guidelines. These are guideposts. So one of the tools that I can offer you that you can use is this characteristics worksheet. And this is what I use at work. 
This is what I use on my consulting engagements to help identify these driving forces. So you can download this from my website under resources, and it's in PDF, PowerPoint, and Keynote format. Change it if you want to, that's fine. Uh, but this allows you to start looking at, and by the way, there's three pages because they show definitions. I show definitions of each of these kind of core characteristics. Um, and I also have a lesson, Lesson 112, on my software development, or uh, Software Architecture Monday, uh, to show kind of how this works. Um, anyways, it's a really useful tool for starting to say, you know, I think I'd like to start doing that. I'd like to start thinking like an architect. And I'm going to see if I can come up with what characteristics on the current product I'm working on are important. And are we really supporting those? And do we have the right architecture in place? Guess what? By doing those three things, you know what you all are doing? Exactly the same thing an architect would do. Thinking like an architect. You don't have to be an architect to think like an architect. So here's the bottom line of this part one right here. You cannot, and this is what I maintain, you cannot do this, create an architecture, unless you have these. Otherwise, how are you going to make a decision? What's needed? This looks like an interesting design, but does it satisfy the needs of the application, the domain, and the business? All right, that's, that's the first part of thinking like an architect. Having those foundational aspects that drive all the rest of your decisions, even at an implementation level. Knowing these, and knowing that scalability is that important, and qualifying it, will allow you to think about the designs of your code with scalability in mind as well, or availability, or fault tolerance. Okay. The next part, though, about thinking like an architect is expanding what's known as our technical breadth, the amount of things we know. Because as an architect, you see a problem. I have to see and visualize in my mind the possible solutions. But what if you only know one particular solution? It might not be the right one. So it turns out that this is called a triangle of knowledge. And there are three types of knowledge that exist in the world. Uh, let's scope it down to technology knowledge. That would be a lot better. Um, well, way up here at the top is the stuff that you know. These are things you do every day. You know them so well that you could actually get up on stage here and talk about them. That would be a little scary, but you could. <laughs> but right below that is a bigger area of knowledge called the stuff that you know that you don't know. This means you know or are familiar about something, but you have no idea how to use it. Um, Close your programming language is a good example. I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard about Clojure. It's a programming language that, uh, boy, you got to love parentheses if you're going to use it. It usually uses datomic, transactional memory, all this kind of stuff. But how many of you can code in Clojure? Not it. <laughs> That's a good example of something that you've heard of that you know that you know nothing about, but you're familiar with it. But the biggest area of knowledge that exists is this bottom large blue area. This is the stuff that you don't know that you don't know. This is all the possible solutions, tools, products, patterns that would be the perfect fit, perfect fit for what you're doing and you don't even know it exists. So, one of the, well, I'll call it a game of life, is to take stuff that you've never, ever heard of, that bottom area of the triangle, stuff that you don't know that you don't know, and move it into the stuff that you know you don't know. How do you do this? Talk with people. Say, oh, I haven't heard of that before. What is it? And now you suddenly have it in your second level of knowledge. It's going to conferences like this and challenging yourself to say, well, I'm a React programmer, so I'm going to do all React talks. Now, the proper way to take advantage of conferences like this is to attend a talk of something you've never heard of. It's a fantastic way to learn about a possible tool, a technique, a solution 
that you may not use now, but it's in your brain. And you'll pull it out sometime and say, wait a minute, I remember I was at GIDS 23, and I remember I was walking along in the, the exposition hall there, and I was like, what is this product? Okay, that's a two or three minute conversation. You have now taken something that you didn't know that you didn't know and say, oh, now I know what it does. Okay, then either something, because we are all technologists, that pique your interest, something that you get really excited about, or your boss says, starting next week, we shall be using closure. Uh-oh. That's when you take something that you know you don't know, and you move it into something now that you know. But there's a cautionary tale here, everybody. Watch out for this top part of the triangle. Because the stuff you know is the stuff you have to maintain. And if you like working 24 hours a day, if you don't have kids, if you have no life and no friends, don't worry about it. <laughs> but if you do, you can't do it all. Because if you don't maintain that, it suddenly trickles down like teardrops all the way back down into something that now you know you don't know. About 10 years ago, I was mostly programming in Scala language. I started the Boston Scala Users Group. Uh, that's all I was doing at client sites with Scala. I loved it. That was 10 years ago. Now, <laughs> I would be lucky to be able to start a Scala class file. Um, it's something I chose not to maintain, so it dripped back down. So just a cautionary tale, be careful. Okay, well let's do an interesting exercise. Because of this, the stuff you know is called technical depth. We all need technical depth, including me, a seasoned architect. We all need technical depth. But that stuff you know, plus the stuff that you know you don't know, is considered technical breadth. And here's the key point. Thinking like an architect, starting to make more effective decisions, create better software systems, and start propelling your career into that tech lead and into that architect position means to exactly focus right here. And that's hard. It means focusing on technical depth with a sacrifice, I'm sorry, technical breadth, with a little bit of a sacrifice of technical depth. Start broadening your horizons. Okay. Well, let's actually play this game. What we're gonna do is we're actually, now that we understand this triangle of knowledge, let's have some fun with it. Let's take a look at the brain of a junior developer. Then let's take a look inside the brain of a senior developer. Then we're gonna take a look inside the brain of a junior architect. And finally, a senior architect. This is going to be an amazing journey. So now that we understand the levels of, tri or the levels of knowledge, let's open up the brain to a junior developer. This is what a junior developer's knowledge triangle looks like typically. Notice, what is the biggest part of this triangle? It's the stuff that you don't know that you don't know. Sure, I am a Java developer. What do you do? Java. What do you know? Java. Okay. Notice, my technical breadth is pretty small. And that's fine. That's appropriate. Because as a junior developer, I am hired for my technical capability on that particular technology. This is good, this is what it should look like. But what happens, are you ready? Watch this, as we move from a junior developer to a senior developer. Did you notice what happened to the triangle? I wanna do that again, because this is gonna start morphing like this. Wait a minute, let me go backwards, one. Are you ready? Watch the shape of the triangle, here we go. Junior developer starts going into a senior developer, five or six years experience. And what do you notice happened? The stuff you know increases. Multiple platforms, multiple languages, multiple patterns, multiple tools, multiple techniques, multiple frameworks, the list goes on. And as a matter of fact, did you notice what part of the triangle 
got smaller. The stuff you know, you didn't know that you didn't know. But notice our technical breadth is still not strong. And that's okay, because we are focused on a technology solution to a problem. But you get that big break, and all of a sudden now, yes, your first opportunity as an architect. You become a junior architect. You ready? I'm going to transfer now. This is what your brain starts to look like. Did you notice what happened as you move into and step into an architect position? What happened? You sacrificed some of that stuff you know, that expertise, to broaden the stuff that you know you don't know. As an architect, you're starting to look at 10 different caching technologies, not just Redis, for example. What are the different caching tools and technologies? What do they support? What are the pros? What are the cons? Oh, I may not know how to code in any of these. That's fine. But as an architect, I know the trade-offs of each of these and which one would probably be the most appropriate solution for our particular problem. Now, final journey. You start developing your career as an architect. And you start getting that senior architect kind of position, that enterprise architect. And this is what your knowledge triangle now starts to look like. Notice, we haven't done much with our technical depth, but we've significantly broadened the stuff that we know we don't know. So this is kind of one of those key tips, tricks, to managing your entire career, regardless of where you are in it. Did you just graduate from school? Cool. Focus on the technology that you're interested in. That's all you should do. And you could use this transition to kind of map out where you should probably be in these various knowledge pieces. Well, Mark, this is absolutely fabulous. This is really cool. I wish I had as much time as you to be able to go research and do stuff and kind of learn things I don't know. Ah, yeah, no, I'm stuck 12 hours a day coding Java. Ah. Let me show you how to do this. So isn't it interesting if we look at the difference between a developer's head and the way they see things and an architect's head and the way they see things? It's all about that middle area. The more you know about stuff you don't know, the more you're going to be able to find solutions to problems that are the most appropriate solution. OK, so how do you do this? How do you start gaining that technical depth? So this is exciting. Well, <clears throat> one of the ways to do it is a conference is like this. Or just start going to some of these resources that are free. And let me show you three that I typically use. Now, the first one I go to quite often is uh, InfoQ, I-N-F-O-Q.com. Uh, now, I'm going to show you this in a little bit, but every uh, two, about two times a week, I get an email with all these different things that are trending, all these different technologies. Um, it's a really, really good go-to place for architecture, for all these kind of things. Technology, you name it. Uh, the second place that I sometimes go to are the D-Zone ref cards. Now, not necessarily D-Zone. Um, in my experience, D-Zone is kind of hit or miss, but the ref cards are really useful because I don't have a lot of time. Uh, when I was in college back in the turn of the century, uh, I did not have time to read War and Peace or Homer's Iliad or Odyssey. I had other things to do, hang out with my friends, just go hiking around and stuff. So what did I do? I leveraged something called Cliff Notes. Now here is Monarch Notes, but these were little booklets that just gave you a summary, the highlights of those epic novels. Yeah, I could, I could read that in an afternoon. And so, so that's what I did most of the time. <laughs> now I'm going back and reading all those wonderful epic novels. But at the time, I wasn't interested. And so those little tiny booklets, Cliff Notes, Monarch Notes, really helped me to participate in the class. 
to really gain the understanding of those books without having all the details that I didn't really care about. Oh, what did I just describe? Ref cards. Yeah, these are two to six page cards that talk about a particular technology. Just the right exact level for me as an architect to say, what is it? Why is it here? What are the good things? And what are the bad things about it? Yeah, so those are, uh, those are pretty useful to gain that technical knowledge without having to go too deep. Oh, you can study what Hazelcast is all about. You don't have to go and code it. You can understand uh, different languages. You don't have to go and code them. You just have to understand what they do, why they're there, how do they differentiate themselves from all the other 25 programming languages I could choose right now. Yeah. Another place to go is the ThoughtWorks Technology Radar, which, by the way, just came out Tuesday. This comes out twice a year. All these are free. This all stuff is all available to you. And the ThoughtWorks Technology Radar, twice a year, um, are most of the luminaries in the field. Neil Ford is one of those, James Lewis, Martin Fowler. I mean, these are folks who have a pulse on the industry. They show you what things are trending, what things aren't. It's a really great resource. Now, here's a little test for all of you. Go to the ThoughtWorks radar. You think, oh, I, I don't need that. I already know what's happening in the field. I already know everything. I know everything. I will guarantee you, they'll show 20 things that are trending in the industry. I will guarantee you, maybe you've heard of four of those. Yeah, what a humbling experience. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> this is something they're saying to adopt and I've never heard of it? What is that? That's something that I don't know that I don't know. And I probably should know it. Not be an expert, but just know it. These are three really good resources. Oh, there's a lot of other good resources to use as well, but these are just three I can offer up to you. Now I can go back and say, huh, what do these look like? Well, let me show you the three levels of knowledge. Now, this might be a little hard to see on the screen here, but this is, uh, I'm gonna zoom in, but this is a snapshot of my email. And this is, let me zoom it in just a little bit. Um, this is what it looks like. So when I get my email, it has a, black, a dark header line with a laundry list of buzzwords. And I look at that, I take a look at that, and all of a sudden I start to see things like, oh, plastic ARM, what is that? Plastic arm, is it like an actual arm? It's plastic? I've never heard of that before. Ha, something that you don't know that you don't know. The bottom level of the triangle. Ha, it happens to be fabric-based microchips, or all sorts of haptic sets, and all it's really cool stuff. Okay, how about this? Um, Solid.js, well, we can ignore that, right? Because every day, another new JavaScript framework comes out. So just <laughs> forget that, yeah, yeah, never mind. Yeah, so that, that's, that's way beyond all three levels of knowledge. That's stuff that you could throw away, okay? That's the trash can, okay? But all this other stuff, Apache Pinot, what does that mean? The Apache Foundation is now making wine? Apache Chardonnay is really good. But Apache Sauvignon is also very good. Yeah, what in the world's Pinot? It's there. Um, stuff like this, you know, uh, AWS Proton. Oh, yeah, we're, we're an AWS shop. What's Proton? Uh, I, 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 I don't know. Should we be using it? I, 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 I don't know. These are things you've never heard of. This is the value of these resources. You see a buzzword that you've never heard of before, Spend a couple of minutes to see what it is. That's all you need to do. And now all of a sudden you say, oh, Proton, where were you six months ago? Oh, it's been out longer than that. Where was I six months ago? If that would have solved all our problems, we could have shaved five months off our project. That's the value of architectural thinking, of expanding that breadth of knowledge. Mark, this is really cool, but I don't have time for this. I wish I had as much time as you to kind of just click on these and peruse these and all this. Well, let me give you a little secret. I don't either. I work between 12 and 15 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't have time for this. So here's my technique. I kind of created something 
called, what, well, at least what I call, um, the 20 minute rule. And here's what I do. I spend 20 minutes a day, just 20, sometimes more, but at least 20 minutes a day on me, on my career, on myself, to expand my technical breadth. Oh, I may go to InfoQ, I may just create a list of words I've never heard of, and that's going to queue up for tomorrow, which I may look at two or three of those. Now, here's the other secret, though. <sighs> when do you do this? Oh, uh, lunch. That'd be a good time. Yeah. How many of us get to take lunch? Seriously. No. Yeah. After, after work, this would be a good time to do it. Uh-huh. Yeah. How many of you have families? Yeah. You get home after a hard day, and your spouse goes, here, I'm going out. And you look at your child and go, what did you do today? Yeah, you're not going to spend 20 minutes learning about Proton. No. Here's the trick. First thing in the morning. Now, let me qualify that. What's the very, very first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? And, but by, by the way, I'll answer that first. You get that blessed cup of coffee or tea. Yes. Okay. What's the very, very, very next thing you do? when you sit down at work, whether it be at your home office or whatever. Email. email. Check email and your day is over. <laughs> you start getting involved. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, no, I've got a meeting in 10 minutes. Uh-oh, we've got a production outage right there. Oh, yeah, you didn't ever. Okay. So my day looks like this. I get that blessed cup of coffee or tea, and then I spend 20 minutes enjoying that nice hot beverage well, I work on me, my career, my architectural thinking, my technical breadth. If I can spend 30, awesome, but 20 is good. Most articles are designed for seven or 10 minutes. My videos on Software Architecture Monday on purpose are 10 minutes. So you could do other things during the 20 minute rule as well. Try it out, try it out because if you can't spend 20 minutes in the morning on yourself, then there's other problems that we need to discuss. Um, I'll be in the speaker's lounge after the thing. <laughs> All right. Well, there's one other aspect. So give it a try. Give it a try. Download that architecture characteristics worksheet. Give it a try. Just see if you can start to think about what are the characteristics that's architectural thinking. Um, Expand your technical breadth. These are easy things that are free. OK, there's one more element that we can talk about, and that's analyzing trade-offs. This is another thing of thinking like an architect. Um, I need to channel my friend, uh, Rich Hickey, um, who created Clojure. And um, he has a quote that's quite controversial, but it's quite funny, um, and sometimes, sometimes quite true. And he says this, developers know the benefits of everything and the trade-offs of nothing. And I've seen it. I mean, it's not always true. I have worked with development teams and developers who do know about trade-offs. But a lot of us get excited about a particular technology, a framework, a tool, a language. And we only see the good stuff. We don't see the bad stuff. Yeah. So let's see about analyzing trade-offs, because this is another way of thinking like an architect. OK. So Here's our first law again, and we keep bringing this up because it's so important. <laughs> Everything in software architecture is a trade-off. In the structural aspect of software architecture and the structural aspect of building systems, there are no best practices. How can you possibly say you should all focus on performance? Oh, uh, we don't care about performance. No, that's not a best practice. You should always use microservices. Yeah, we're a small startup shop. I mean, challenge yourself. Neil and I have. That's how we came up with the law. Yeah. Now, I qualified it to say the structural aspect, because there are some best practices in architecture. One of them, always collaborate with your development team and stakeholders. If you don't, it'll fail. Yeah, that's a best practice, but it's the process part of architecture. I use architecture decision records to justify 
my architecture decisions. That's a best practice. Yeah, but within the structural aspect, no, there's none. So, follow-up question. In our second book, Architecture of the Hard Parts, and that is, okay then, so what happens when there are no best practices? This, everybody, is why architecture is hard. It's because we don't have that many guideposts, because it's all 100% contextual. So how do we make decisions? This is one of the things an architect does. This is architectural thinking, analyzing trade-offs. Well, not surprisingly, how do then do we make a decision? A or B? Uh, I guess we could flip a coin. No, I have a better idea. Understand the business drivers first. What's important to the business? Uh, and they say, time to market. The most important thing. Well, we've got a lot of important things, but that one's way up at the ceiling. All right, fine, so we understand that. Do you remember the first section? What do we do with that information? Yeah, exactly. Doesn't matter if you're not an architect. You say, huh, so they need speed to market. Well, I wonder what that means. That kind of translates to architectural characteristics about maintainability, testability, the ease of incompleteness of testing, and also deployability, the ceremony of deploying our software, the frequency and the overall risk. It's all three of these that give us time to market. Oh, it doesn't matter how fast you can find the change and make it as a developer. If it takes you six weeks to test, good luck. <laughs> and if you're wondering, by the way, um, if you don't believe me about these three, what is the fastest possible way in the world to get your changes released to your customers? Fastest way in the world. Don't test. <laughs> ah, make the change, release. Make the change, release. Make the change, release. Yeah. Is that time to market? No. That's killing your company. <laughs> yes. So the point is, it's all three of these. We need that ease of and completeness of testing because as we move faster, we want to make sure we're not introducing more and more and more and more bugs into the system. We will lose. It doesn't matter how fast we can be. It's all three of these. We take this information, and then we do this. Huh, I have a decision to make. What do I do? I look at the pros and cons, and I try to boil them down and simplify them. And this is what it ends up to be. Performance versus maintainability. That's what it boils down to. Single service, three services. Single service is faster. Three services is, gives us better maintainability. Pick one. It's almost like cap theorem. We can't really do both of these. Well, how do we make a choice? Obviously, performance. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> I better not get on that soapbox, thank God. <laughs> Pre-optimization of performance could even be a keynote. Oh, boy. Yeah, because think about it. As a developer, we want things to be fast. That's what our primary focus is on our mind. That's seeing things with a developer's eye, a developer's perspective. We want fast code. Seeing things with an architect's eye says, yeah, we got to make our code fast. But hold on a second. What's most important to the business? Well, if we can tie them back to the architecture characteristics, we see that maintainability is actually on that list. And if we tie it back to the business need, we see that time to market would be much better if I can make maintainable code. In other words, break apart my services. And so do you see, by going backwards now, I can actually make a decision and say, that's why we're gonna break apart our services. It's gonna be slower, but time to market is more important to the business. That's what the architecture has to support. That is modern trade-off analysis. This is now seeing decisions that you need to make with an architect's eye, an architect's point of view. Okay, well, let's try this out. Let's actually show, I wanna show you a couple of tips. Um, the first pro tip is this. Watch out for something called the out of context trap. As a matter of fact, this is an out of context anti-pattern when we're starting to analyze trade-offs. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm wondering of a query, I can't decide whether I should use a shared library or a shared service. 
for all my shared functionality. This is a developer decision, something a developer is probably going to make. Where do I put all of those calculators that are shared, all of my utilities, uh, my utility.cs, my utility.java, my utility.py? What do I do with all that code? Hmm. Well, I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. I just attended GIDS 23, and I attended this keynote about analyzing trade-offs. That would be a good start. So let's actually do this. So what I'm going to do is create a scorecard. And I'm going to start looking at the pros and cons of each of these. So heterogeneous code, that's the first one. Which works better? Well, heterogeneous code does not work well with shared libraries. Because if I've got five platforms, I've got five copies of that shared library, five copies of the code. But with a shared service, doesn't matter if you're even in a mainframe. Call me. It's in one place. Ooh, score one for shared service. Ah, but what about high code volatility? Our code changes all the time. Well, in a shared library, what's going to happen? I'm going to continue to version until I reach that max version number that's supported. And all of you, even if you're not using the utility, are going to have to retest and redeploy and rebuild every single week. That's a lot of churn. Oh, that's not going to work. Ah, but what happens with a shared service? That code changes all the time? Yeah, I just change the podium. Yeah, I just change the podium. Yeah, you guys all just use it. OK. Um, what about the ability to version things, though? Ah, ha, ha, ha. shared library now has a check mark. This gets a plus one. Yeah, it's hard to version runtime changes. But I can version a DLL or a jar file or a gem. That's not hard. Actually, it is. Fallacy number nine of distributed computing. What about overall change risk? Yeah, if I make a change to that podium, that's our shared service right there, and I really mess something up, I've just now broken every single one of you because it's hard to version. That's a runtime change in production. Once I deploy that service, all of a sudden, boom, 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 everybody's like, hey, why are you all leaving the auditorium? Uh-oh, <laughs> because that change made the speaker go away. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you can't hear me, <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> and so it's a lot more risk. But, uh, but with shared libraries, I have backwards compatibility. I have agility. Vancat needs a change immediately. OK, Vancat, type, type, type. Here you go, version 2.3.4, done. I gave that to him just now. The rest of you do 2.4.2. Backwards compatibility and agility. Because now we have to start now all changing at some point. <laughs> but what about the operational characteristics? Things like performance, things like fault tolerance, scalability. These are all bad in a shared service. If this podium fell to the ground, no longer available, Neither are any of you. Yeah. All of a sudden, if all of you, and I think I did this yesterday on stage here, all of a sudden, ask me a question all at once. I'm going to get overwhelmed and just curl up on the stage and to a ball and start crying. Um, yeah, these are the problems. It's going to be slow to go all the way from the front there, especially with all these pathways, to ask me a question. If you want to ask me a question to communicate with me, you have to actually come onto the stage and shake my hand. That's going to take forever. Not with a shared library. Do you see a clear winner here? Yeah, count up the check marks. And we find this is why using a shared library is a best practice. Hopefully now you know I'm teasing, because there is no such thing as a best practice. This, everyone, is an anti-pattern. Avoid it like the plague. This is called the out of context trap. What's my context? Me, Mark Richards, personally. This is my context. Well, we have services written in four different languages, so we're using polyglot programming. And we're not really concerned about performance or scalability. No, our biggest issue in our product right now is managing changes to shared functionality that occur frequently. That's my problem. Oh, what happens if we go back to the scorecard? That's plus two to zero. Yeah, 
That's how we make the choice. We apply the context, and now a shared service is better. Even though it has more X's, I don't care about those X's. Now, a lot of you probably use scorecards, and you do weighting. So you say, well, this one's weighted higher than this one. Well, go ahead and do that. But if you don't care about it, weight it at zero, and then count it up. Because it has no bearing for our context. So that, watch out for this kind of, 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 of problem. OK. Um, here's another pro tip. And this one's hard. Try to avoid, not try to avoid. There is no try. It's do or not do. Avoid over evangelizing any particular technology, framework, solution, something you found. We get all excited about something. Oh, I found, I found gRPC, Google's Remote Procedure Call. It, 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 it's the best thing I've ever seen. I can get 10 times, more than 10 times better performance in our system. Our system's too slow. I found the solution, gRPC. Oh, 10 times performance increase. It, it, it's wonderful. It's exciting. It's great. Try to avoid that. Why? Because of the first law of software architecture. Everything in software architecture is a trade-off. And the problem is, you all get very excited about it. And what have I just done by evangelizing? I have just hidden all of the trade-offs. And they're there. No one finds them. No one sees them. No one knows they're there because we're all excited because I evangelized something. I got excited about it. I made you excited about it. This is a very dangerous thing. You know why architects are always grumpy? They always have a frown. They're always walking around like this. Because we can't get excited about anything. Because everything has a trade-off. It's a very depressing place to be. Yes. Oh. All right. Um, so that, everyone, is architectural thinking. That's seeing things with an architect's eye, an architect's point of view which will help you start accelerating your career into kind of that architect position because you're already acting the role. You're already doing it. Get the practice now before all of a sudden you get handed the golden keys of architecture and say, I, 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 I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. <laughs> and now I'm way over my head. Practice it now. But even if that's not your career aspiration, Maybe you want to always stay a developer. That's cool, too. But now, using this stuff, you can create more effective and more efficient and more correct software solutions as a developer. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you.